Your, 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 your attention, please. Your attention, please. Your attention, please. And now the moment we've been waiting for is here. Charles, mate. Welcome to the potty. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I'm fucking stoked to come on. It's cool, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. Bit, it's a bit nerve wracking, isn't it? I'm fucking terrified. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I was saying to my mate the other day, I was like, right, I'm going to do a podcast. It's going to be good. He was like, are you nervous? I'm like, yeah, I'm freaking mate. And I'm speaking to my mate, and yeah. I'm still nervous. I'm yeah, like, yeah. I, I told one of my friends, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to a podcast on Friday. She's like, you're going to be shit. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fuck you. Yeah, <laughs> like, I'm not I'm, exactly I'm, filling uh, your confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm talking to a mate. I'm sure it'll be it'll fine. Be, it'll be okay. And I ask about a million and one questions. Yeah, so. I mean, I've had chats with you before. Like, yeah. it's the easiest conversation to yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, yeah fair yeah, enough. Yeah. But yeah, so thank you for coming on. No, dude, thanks for having so, me. So I just want to go, obviously, basically, I started this podcast. So I wanted to speak to my people who I thought were interesting and were potentially in the fitness industry. And I also find it interesting people who are like way better than me at certain things. Mm. And when it comes to training, you are probably the strongest person I know. Yeah, thanks, man. Which, I don't want to blow too much smoke up your no, ass. No, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to blow too much smoke up your ass. But obviously, you and I met in Fitness First in 2022. Yeah. And you were this curly-haired surfer dude from Byron. And I was yeah. like, what the fuck's he going to know? Yeah, I was like, yeah. what the fuck's that kind of guy going to know? And then I started seeing you pull some weight. And I was like, oh, 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 that's different. <laughs> different, different. So you are a powerlifter by, your sport would be powerlifting, Yeah, right? 100%, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. So, 25, 29 years old. I want to be as strong as humanly possible. Yep. Take it away, Charles. How uh, am I doing it? Yeah, look, first thing, go grab yourself a coach. Uh, yep. 100%. There's heaps and heaps of really good free programs out there. Um, but if you just get yourself a coach who is in powerlifting or has been around it for quite a while, it's going to make it so much easier for you than trying to do all the guesswork of like figuring out your technique and figuring yeah, out what to lift, how much to lift, how frequently to do it. Um yeah, I mean, like, I think at the end of the day, powerlifting's a pretty simple sport. We just lift a, cu- lift a heavy object in a certain different, like, a couple yeah. different directions, whatever. Um, but there is a lot of stuff that can go into it because it is so basic. So getting a coach to, kind like, of yeah, out the details guide you sense. through all of that is really helpful. Of course, it makes sense. Yeah. So I had this debate with my friend the other day. What do you define as strong? Yeah. Um, so when I'm talking to, like, I'm going to say an everyday person, yeah, yeah. for lack of a better yeah. word, like... If someone's in, like, if a guy is in the gym and you're benching 100 kilos, like, that's fucking strong. That yeah. is really, really strong, and the vast majority of the population will never do that. Yeah, 100%. But if you go into powerlifting and you say, you're 90 kilo male, you're benching 100 kilos, you're absolute dog shit. <laughs> yeah, it's like in that small echo chamber yeah, of that world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As soon as you step into that world, and it's not that anybody would think you were bad or whatever, it's just objectively you are not lifting as much weight as everyone else. I look at, um, so my bench press is definitely one of the lifts I struggle with and I'm benching 145. You might go, that's really, really strong. I'm thinking in my head, people in my weight class are benching 200 kilos and that's at a national level, not at an international level. So in my head I go, my my bench press is pretty shit. Oh my God. But if you've just been lifting for long enough and you know, you're benching something like 100 kilos, you're yeah. squatting more than 140, like all of these little milestone numbers of like two plates, three plates, yeah. maybe a four plate deadlift. You are really, really strong compared strong. to the like the vast majority of uh, like the general population. And I'll have to ask a question, right? Mm. In the powerlifting world, you do the arch, you do the big, yeah, yeah, you yeah, do yeah, the chest yeah. up. Yeah. Is that cheating? Nah, fuck no. Is that no, cheating? No, no, no. no. I, I've had this debate with so many people, including powerlifters who are really strong. And it's like, Every single sport, there's a set of genetics that is going to benefit you. Like Basketball, that. it's being really tall, having really, really oh, long like limbs, that. right? And that's, but we don't go, oh, LeBron James isn't actually the best player in the world because he's fucking tall. We go, he's the best player in the world. If the best bench, bench presser in the world has better g- genetics than you and can arch better than you, they are just better than you at that sport. And you've got to deal with it. Oh, I love that. I've never heard it being uh, described Same like that thing before. for like for like deadlifts. You look at the best deadlifters, regardless of if it's sumo, or, sumo or conventional. Oh, we're gonna they're going to have. One hundred percent. I can see that. your eyes light up. <laughs> um, like if you've got long arms, you're going to be a great deadlifter, and people are going to be shitty about it because your range of motion won't be as big. Yeah, of course. But it doesn't matter. Like I can probably jump and like nick the ring playing basketball, and there'll be people that just walk up and. Totally. This shit. For sure. You know, sure, it's the confines sure. of the sport. We work within it. Yeah. And that's it. So when you're looking at like strength and sh- being strong from a powerlifting perspective, mm. you're looking that through a range of essentially a horizontal push, a 
squat mm. and a deadlift and a hinge essentially that's what you would describe as strong yeah yeah got if you it. were just going like i need to be as good of a powerlifter as possible you just get good at those three movements got it, and that's got kind it. of it because it doesn't matter how much you bicep curl in powerlifting it yes. matters how much you bench press and of the course, rest of it of course what made yeah. you what made you even get into powerlifting yeah um so it was really, really weird timing. And I'll admit that I'm basically just a TikTok lifter because of this. But <laughs> like I got into powerlifting because I was in COVID. I'd burnt through all of my standard YouTube fitness to watch. Yeah. And I came across Russ Swole. Um, Russell Orr here. I don't know if you know who he is. Probably not, no. If you see a picture of him, incredibly, like, incredible genetics. Really, really jacked. Really strong. He's won IPF Worlds quite a few times. He's got a great YouTube channel. I started watching that. I came out of COVID. All about strength. All, all about powerlifting. Yeah, yeah. All about powerlifting. It's not that informative. It's, yeah. it, you know, he's a, a very stylish guy, very flamboyant character. Um, but I came out of lockdown and I was like, all right, this is it. I'm into fucking powerlifting now. And that was it. Um, I love that. So we were only talking two, three years ago. Wait, is that yeah. like back in 21? Mid 21? Uh, so I was in Byron. So lockdowns weren't that full on for us. So that was like 2020 really. Got you, and then okay. I think I did my first competition in 2021. Um, but like a, another underlying factor of why I got into it is I dealt with a lot of body dysmorphia as a kid. Oh, God, um, God. So when I, when I first got into the gym at 16, I was weighing 76 kilos maybe. Um, and I just like... Chuck myself on a calorie deficit, 2,000 calories for two years straight. Just to try and get shredded. Just to try and get shredded. I got shredded. I also felt like shit and looked like shit. Yeah. I would have I would have the lunch lady at um, at school when I go and order a long black, they would be double checking that I'd had breakfast because I, lo I, I looked gone. And looking back on photos, yeah. it was not healthy. I thought I looked fucking sick, but it was, it was not healthy. So yeah. finding an outlet in the gym that was performance-based and performance-orientated was the, was the other big thing for me, not just the social media thing. I was I like, like okay, cool. I can go into the gym and not worry about as much like – how I look, and I can worry more about how I'm performing. I love and as, as a side effect of that, I look better now than I did back then. Yeah, because you shot yeah. for a performance-based goal. Exactly. I fucking love that. Yeah, I love that yeah. you said that, actually, because I do think a lot of fit, fitness-based metrics is how do you look, mm. what's your body fat percentage, how much do you weigh, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I do think sometimes we forget that fitness is actually there to make you perform better yeah. in whatever avenue, healthier, make you perform better in whatever avenue that you want to go down. So I think changing that kind of mindset from... I need to have abs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Coming from someone probably like me, I was. I remember growing up with no abs whatsoever. Yeah, same. I remember going, "Well, I need to get abs. I need to get a six pack, and then my life will be complete." Yeah, I don't know. If I, I don't know how you were with girls growing up, but girls didn't like me growing up as a kid. So then I remember thinking, "Well, my mates have abs; they get girls, so therefore I need abs to get girls." Yeah. And then I quickly realised that yeah. having abs also didn't get me girls. <laughs> yeah, it didn't. <laughs> that was a bigger problem. <laughs> it, it didn't help. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was always good. I was always, I always had lots of like good girl friends, yeah. but they were friends. Friend, you, and yeah. I'll admit, getting abs didn't change an, a thing right. at all. Um, for me, that was cutting my hair. If you'd ever seen a photo of me with long hair, did you have the proper surf? I had hair? like down to the shoulders, long, long oh. hair. Oh, but if because your hair when I first met you was really curly, so you yeah. could even still get it. Like... Yeah, yeah, it would just be like long ringlets all the way down wow. to my shoulder. Cutting that off helped me get the girls. So really? that. that... <laughs> <laughs> well, also, now that you've gone buzzkit, you've, you're blessed with the hairline. Yeah. You're, that's a strong I was, hairline. I was terrified when Ryan was like, I'm going to shave your head. Uh, I was like, it's what, if, what if the hairline doesn't work, though? I'm happy with it, and it's low maintenance. And I just ask Ryan every two weeks, can you shave my head, and that's it. You'll laugh at this. There comes a moment in every man's life where... <laughs> You have to look at what you've got. <laughs> and I had that moment of like two years ago. I was like, it's time, brother. It's no, but time. It's time. Because I think when we started together at Fitness First, yeah. you had head in yeah, 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 yeah. No, I remember when you came in with a shaved head for the first time. I was like, yeah, this just looks so much better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's one of those things you've just got to put it out there. And you know what? It's kind of like, except me for me. This is yeah, me. Yeah, this yeah. is me. <laughs> You'll laugh at this, right? So uh, I'll shave my head. I shave my head like every three or four days. Yeah, yeah. And I was doing one of my little trimmer early. I was like, Zzz, and mm. then halfway through, just... <laughs> Oh. No way. So then I've got like literally like half a head of hair. Yeah, like, yeah. Like literally half a head. I was like, right, what do I do? Try to plug it in, charge it, nothing. Oh. So then I walked down the bridge road, which was packed at lunchtime, <laughs> just with, like, with like, half my half head. head of hair. Yeah, I walked in, the guy was like, what happened? I was like, I just need you to just zip that. Zip that yeah, yeah zip. just fucking fix it yeah, for me, exactly. man. That's all I want. But I imagine growing up in Byron, surf culture and everything, it's such an outdoorsy place. Mm. Well, did you pretty much grow up surfing all the time? And is that maybe where, this is going to sound dark, but like no, no. maybe where the body dysmorphia came from a little bit? It's like I'm at, in an environment where everyone has their kit off all the time. No, I actually think that is like probably like an underlying 
cause of it because I was out surfing. Mm. Like my dad was a surfer. We grew up surfing. We were just on the weekends. That's what we went and did. Mm-hmm. As I got older, I stopped doing it more and more and, you know, got into the gym and whatnot. Yeah. But um, definitely like, you know, you'd be out, you'd see in Byron Bay. Tanned. Tanned, ripped, good looking, ripped, ripped, good looking yeah. everywhere, Tats, right? everything. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and then you look at yourself and you're like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> what, what am I doing? Yeah, um, I think that was a good part of it. And I think, like, everybody that I was friends with was also, like, really sporty. Yeah, of course. Everyone played soccer, uh, football yeah. growing up. Um, yeah, good I'll, try, I'll try to call it football for you. <laughs> um, you know, so everybody was pretty lean. But somehow I was still this, I'm not going to say chubby because I wasn't chubby, but that's how I felt. Yeah, um, no, like, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, so I think sense. that is an underlying cause for well, it, for sure. It's definitely an interesting thing that you pro- we probably don't take into consideration a lot is that the environment you grow into will either feed that I grew up in England. Mm. 99% of the time, it's rainy, it's cold, mm. it's overcast. I very rarely have my t- top off yeah. in front of anyone. Yep. If I was in an environment growing up where every single day after school, my friends were going to the beach or were going surfing or going swimming, whatever it is, especially growing up as a kid and maybe, and I, don't, I know I was like this, that mm. would have fucking sucked. Yeah. That would have been the kid on the beach with a t-shirt on. Yeah, like, yeah. Dan, it's 30 degrees, take your hoodie off. Like, no, <laughs> no, it's I, <laughs> I, I can't. Wanna, I don't want to. I'm cold. Yeah, no, but yeah. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. And then, so when you got into powerlifting, mm. what was those first steps? Like, what did that look like for you? Yeah, um, I don't even know what I did. I thought, I thought I knew everything because I'd had all of COVID to just research how to train. So I just started writing my own programs, actually. Um, and they were shit. And I look back at them and they're some of the most dog water programs I've ever looked at. But that's how everybody starts, how everybody right? Starts. Like we look back at yeah. old, old programs of clients and we're like, oh, fuck. Why, why, did, why did we make you do I'm this? Like, yeah, I'm like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> that was really, really bad. Um, What's so I, that? Uh, there's a theory. What's the... Uh, it's the... Uh, Dunning-Kruger model. Dunning-Kruger, exactly. Yeah, at the start, you think you know everything. You think you know everything. You think you know nothing. You realize you know nothing, but you actually know more than everybody else and now you're at the pit of confidence knowing the most uh, like, is that what the kind of I'm not going to say I'm yeah. there just yet because yeah. I don't think I, I am aware that I don't know as much as I think I know yeah um but I I'm definitely not the, the all-knowing whatever I, just I, yet that Dunning-Kruger effect definitely definitely applies to personal trainers every coach 100%. will start out every coach I don't yeah. care who you are you will start out in a gym yeah and you'll be like I know what I'm talking about yeah, yeah. I know exactly how to do it and then you look at those programs years on yeah and I'd be worried for you if you didn't think they were shit. Yeah, yeah. It meant you, that means you just didn't develop. Yeah, you exactly. didn't get any better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you've yeah. kind of stuck to the original thing. That's not a good. That's not that's good. Not yeah. good at all. If yeah. nothing has changed in your coaching practice from day dot and now, like a yeah. couple years later, you're probably, you're, not developing it. you're, you're being... probably a pretty bad coach as well. <laughs> and like to be brutally honest, <laughs> yeah, like like even like you know like the Dunning Kruger model has been around for ages. I knew what the Dunning Kruger model was when yeah. I first started, but I was like, no, nah, it doesn't apply to me. <laughs> <laughs> It so did. Good. It really Wait, did. That's so good. I know what I'm talking about. This Dunning guy he doesn't know. No, no, no. He knows everything but me. No, I know exactly yeah, what you yeah. mean. That's hilarious. So when you started programming for yourself, yep. was you should walk in, all right, I'm going to deadlift today. I'm yeah, going to um, squat today. And I'm just going to kind of revert, like just work through those basic yeah, movements. Yeah. So I always... Um, um, always like was pretty methodical with how I program. And I think that I still am very methodical with it. Um... But I would just come in and go, cool, I'm going to squat and deadlift and then I'm going to do X, Y, Z. And it was probably just way too many accessories. It was probably yeah. way too much squat and deadlift to start with in the first just place. Too much volume. Just maxing out every single week. Um, me and Dylan started training together and it was basically like, oh, cool, we're going to go do like a five by five on squat. And then all of a sudden we're warming up to a one rep max. And that was every single week. Yeah, um, but I think that is like a really integral part of getting into the gym as a young guy is the kind of like, can, can I swear? I realize I've swore Dude, quite I, a bit. I swear. Okay, cool. It's really, it's really like the fuck about find out yeah. kind of stage. And you have to do it to find out. Um, yeah, of course. I like that. And do you notice after a certain amount of time that, if, say, if you've been running five by fives or then you've been running up to one rep maxes mm. most weeks in training, after months, you go, my numbers aren't going up as yeah. much as they should be. Yeah, yeah. You kind of realize that after a point, you go, oh, what's going on? I probably need to change something. Yeah. And then us looking back at that now and like knowing what we know, yeah. um, we go, yeah, cool. That was dumb. No wonder you stalled out. Like there was no baseline volume. There was no actual stimulus for you to get stronger. You were just... You basically... Yeah. So the you've tried to basically get stronger by doing your one rep max. That's not a builder for a strength. Yeah. That's an example of strength almost. That's Yeah, that's great. Um, I think it's, I, I can't remember who said it, um, but it's like a one rep max or, or, or a, if we just do like a single in the gym, mm. so a one rep at RP8 or whatever, mm. that is our expression of strength that's for it. the day. That's the word. But it's, it's not a stimulus for strength. It does not 
give us that much stimulus. Yes, yeah. that's a great expression. I think my old coach said exactly that to me. Yeah, I, 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 right, he would have right, for sure. I was like, right, I want to jack up the waist. And he's like, just because you've hit a PB on your one rep max or two rep max, whatever that may be, that's an expression of you being strong. Yeah. That's not what's going to make us get stronger, actually. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's, um, that, was a, that was a Melbourne strength coach, right? Yeah, 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 it would have been. I'm, it's probably likely I heard it from them, in all yeah. honesty. Like, that's where I took a good bit of... Um, education from and just learning from when I was getting more and more into powerlifting was them. they got a great YouTube channel, great Instagram. I was going to say, so being in Byron, I imagine, maybe I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, I imagine the powerlifting world in Byron isn't huge. It's non-existent. It's non-existent. Yeah, I was the only one doing it. Well, maybe me, Did you wear maybe the me and Dylan. Thing? Did you walk I, didn't, I didn't have a soft suit just yet. I think when I first wore my soft suit, it was here in Melbourne. Um, it would have been a bold move. Oh, it would have been an incredibly <laughs> bold <laughs> move in Byron Bay. You would have copped some weird looks because everybody's in there doing their yoga and yeah. their Pilates. And you know and what? Like... Though, that's a crazy thing because some of the people walking around Byron are b- quite bizarre. Yeah, you see some weird shit. Yeah, so they were looking at you like, that guy's weird. He's got like a onesie on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, you know what's actually weird yeah. then. So was Strength Culture one of the first places you were able to look at and kind of get a good base of YouTube for that kind of power? Yeah, I, I think they were really they really were. Um them, Calgary Barbell, yeah. um, and uh, what is his name? I can sit like envision what he looks like. Is his it name. a Nexus guy? No, I, actually, no, it, I wasn't going to say them, but yeah, Will and Mickey Crozier, um, I took heaps from. Yeah, okay. uh, particularly because they were actually pretty close to Byron. So once I actually got into powerlifting, I went up and visited their gym quite a bit, uh, did a mentorship with them as well, nice. um, and took quite a bit from them. Nice. That's yeah, good. but definitely strength culture, and then just branching out and learning more and more, and you kind of discover people who are outside of like the Australian powerlifting industry, and yeah. start learning from their content too. So I was speaking to Alexi about this. So you know that in power, uh, powerlifting, you want to get stronger. Mm. One of the very well, one of the ways of getting stronger is to build more muscle. But one of the ways of building more muscle is to be in a surplus from a um, dieting perspective. Mm. Powerlifting is also a weight-based sport where yeah. you are working for 84 kilos, for example, in that weight division. Yeah, yeah. How do you get strong and build muscle without increasing too much body weight? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, look, it, to, to answer that question, it's just you've got to do it really, really slowly, eating at, like, a maintenance to the slightest surplus okay, where yeah. you just, like, your body weight average might not change each week. It might change every fortnight or three weeks or something like that taking it really really slow but i think if you're trying to get as much as you can out of powerlifting and you're new to it then not caring about your weight class is the best thing that you could do i have been in the under 90 slash under 93 weight class for two or three years now because i was doing it when i was 84 and i'm doing it now where i'm 87 and i'll do it in a couple months when i'm you know sitting at 90 sitting at 90 or whatever because i've like i don't uh, yes, if I dropped it down to the under 82.5s or 83s, whatever, I would be more competitive. But in the long term, I will be weaker because I've I've not given myself that time to gain weight and actually build muscle. Whereas if I just go, cool, I'm going to cop it on the chin and just be less competitive in the under 90s. But I'm gonna. That's gonna benefit me in the long term because yeah, I'm gonna have sense. all of this extra time spent in a surplus eating. Yes, that yeah. makes sense. That makes sense. I think it's a, a pitfall <laughs> that a lot of young lifters and a lot of like young athletes getting into powerlifting as they go, I want to be in the under seventy four weight class as a sub junior because this means I can take X Y Z record. But it's like, On does that matter scale. long term? Yeah, really though, that's a good like way of no one, no one is talking about the best sub junior of all time. They're talking <laughs> about the best open lifter oh, of all I like time. That. That's a great, like, and it's a good way of looking at this training thing as a, a long term, yeah. a long term perspective. Yeah, and it's also probably good as well to like. The goal of the sport is to get as strong as possible. The way mm. you get as strong as possible is to, you know, over time increasing that weight yeah. and then actually developing the skills to do it. Because I imagine as well there's a skill development perspective for that sure. comes 100%. the higher the weight you're lifting. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Like the skill that's needed to deadlift uh, like 270 is significantly less than to deadlift 180 kilos. Like crazy. Um, get building muscle takes a huge is a huge part of it, but also just refining the technique is massive too. Um, you see, like if you go and watch the, the live stream of IPF Worlds or something like that, you'll see that all of them, nobody's lifting with the same technique, but they're all lifting with really good technique. Um, no one's in there winning on shit technique the, the technique. that I can think of. Really. No, that makes sense. Yeah. And I think there's definitely, when you come from this from a sporting aspect, it's like you look at the guy, I'm a big jiu-jitsu guy, mm. the guys who are absolutely killing, yes, you've got some absolute athletic phenoms, phenoms in there and they're incredible, mm. but their skill development and their foundations is absolutely yeah, yeah. exceptional. And you don't ever get away from those basic skills that allow you to kind of yeah, yeah. build everything on top and of they're not And they're not all rolling or fighting like in the exact same style or whatever, but no. all if you look at their fundamental technique, it ticks all of the right boxes. That's right? a great, yeah. great point, yeah. That's yeah. a great, great point. 
Yep. So now on to the, the main topic where we're going to have a big debate. Nice. Sumo versus convention. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've had this debate. This is what, because I grew up in the, in the world of like 15, 16. If I saw someone doing a sumo deadlift, I'd be like, that's not a fucking deadlift. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, like what no, the fuck and, is that? And, yeah. I, um, and I probably grew up in that world. I think I saw a C-bum saying, ah, oh, sumo's it's not a real sumo's deadlift. Sumo's not a real deadlift. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so yeah. Can, and then I can then met you. I met the powerlifting boys. Mm. And then you're now deadlifting 270 kilos. Yeah. Which is 70 kilos, pretty much more than my deadlift mm. from sumo, which is ridiculous. Yeah. And I've often wondered, does the mechanics of a sumo deadlift and the mechanics of a conventional deadlift, is the range of movement different? So is it sumo easier? Uh, uh, so I don't think it's like a blanket statement of sumo is easier. You can actually, people have actually like graphed this out and collected the data. And when you look at lighter weight classes, the majority of deadlifters pull uh, or the majority of lighter weight classes pull uh, sumo. But as you get heavier and heavier throughout the weight classes, it actually starts to shift back towards conventional. Yeah. That's the couple of reasons. Like when you're a really big guy with a massive gut, yeah. um, getting into a sumo position and your mobility is atrocious, it's not going to happen. Really? Conven conventional probably benefits you more. Um, That's it. I actually would have, for some reason, I would have thought it would be the the alternative I yeah, thought I would so, have having like a wider base stance so most people like in the under 120s or bigger will have like a wider stance like maybe more wide than a classic conventional or whatever and when you say 120 you mean one, less than 120 Let, uh, let's say 120 up just yeah, like the big, the, the big, big yeah, boys. Big, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got no cap on their weight limit. But uh, it probably, maybe less of a gut thing and more of like a mobility thing. They can't open up their hips or externally rotate as much. Yeah. Um, and just doing a something like a conventional deadlift is just simply easier and more consistent. Um, is, if we were to look at like sumo simply easier than conventional, I'd probably say not. I, th I've, I would find it more technically difficult because now there's more things we have to worry about in terms of technique compared to a conventional deadlift. Please explain. But so conventional deadlift, you set mm. your feet underneath. Yep. We're going to go very basic, set your feet underneath your hips, mm -hmm. hinge down to the bar, grab onto the bar, stand up. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty easy. Yeah. Really, really easy to set your feet in the right position at the right angle because it's kind of just like toes facing forwards, yeah, course, right? Yeah. You don't worry about that too much. Conventional de uh, sumo deadlift, now you've got to worry about like, are your feet even? Are they, is it even on the bar? Are they also turned out correctly? When you hinge down, are you pushing into external rotation or internal rotation? Because we kind of want one or the two, depending on how you lift. Yep. Um, it's not, there's probably more things to think about. So if I had a brand new lifter come to me and I look at them and I go, oh, you know what, your leverages probably suit sumo. If they had never deadlifted before, I'd probably just start them on conventional because it is just easy to learn. Oh, yeah. But once you learn the technique of conventional, I actually think sumo deadlift is just a very similar movement with a wider stance. And that's it. And you mentioned that, that like having the longer arms would help with the deadlift. Yeah, right? yeah. Do you say the same with a sumo that different body shapes would aid that movement more so than nah. conventional? No, nah, there's not. I don't think you can really pick out one trend. Like some people might say like a longer, like shorter legs and longer arms might benefit a sumo more because then it's like even less range of motion. Yeah. But it's, it's the, the amount of the range of motion doesn't matter if the position that you're in can't produce force. So... If, if sumo deadlift isn't a strong position because you can't internally rotate well through your joints and push force down into the ground, yeah. it's not going to work for you and just doing a, a conventional deadlift is good. It is better, sorry. Um, like if, if it was just a range of motion thing, yeah. every single person would be doing sumo. Yeah, that's but, it, but it's not. That, that's how my like simple brain works. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. It's probably a bit of a smaller range of movement. That way, it might be a bit easier to mm. do a sumo yeah. rather than conventional. And and then like uh, to add on top of that as well, a big part of it is like it's it, it there's a slight change in like where the st which tissues the stress is placed upon. A sumo deadlift is a lot more adductor dominant, and some people's hips just can't handle that. Um, so doing a conventional dead like maybe sumo deadlift looks slightly better, yeah. but if it beats up your hips so much that you can't deadlift frequently and actually make progress on it and progress the load, then it's pointless and you might as well do something that's easier to manage uh, in terms of stress on the body. So my next question, and I was having this debate as well, mm -hmm. is if we're doing a competition yep. where my deadlift versus your deadlift, my yep. squat versus your squat, my bench versus know, your I bench. I know where this is going, definitely, but yeah. But does it not make more sense to have everyone just doing the same movement pattern? It, you know what, fundamentally I think yes, but it's too far gone in the sport now that changing yeah. it would be really silly. Like it's, it's changing this massive thing in the sport and adding this huge thing that there's no point in doing it. And I think at the end of the day, right, the powerlifting is let's move as much weight as possible. Yeah. 
if let's somebody not get stuck in the trenches, let's not let's get just... stuck in the trenches. And like, if somebody can move more weight with deadlift, let them move more weight with deadlift. Again, yeah. it's a genetics thing. Like, yeah. if your genetics suit sumo deadlifting, then go and do it. If they don't, don't do it. I like but that. don't complain because yours don't. I actually kind of like that mindset is that the sport is let's just see who can lift the most weight. Yeah. Let's not get stuck in the minutiae of his techniques a little bit different. We're yeah. just trying to move as much weight yeah, as yeah. possible, that's it. obviously. That's but it's it. obviously still to the competition guidelines or whatever. Yeah. But as long as those are ticked off, then let's just throw some weight around, I imagine. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, of all your different trainings, so you've been training since like 15, 16? Yeah. yeah. Did you try and go down like the bodybuilding route and then the conditioning route and then the hybrid route? Or yeah. Or did you kind yeah. of pivot towards powerlifting pretty quickly? I, I never went through like bodybuilding or hybrid. I, I went through a big calisthenic stage. Push-ups on push-ups. <laughs> Just push-ups, <laughs> handstands, planches, all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. You were a Byron boy. I was. I was <laughs> a Byron a, boy. I, I was can in see the, the long hair. I was in the fucking yoga room doing handstand push-ups so and all of cool. that shit. Um, but I, that probably came from like the background of doing uh, uh, gymnastics as a kid as well. Oh, so like when I first got into the gym, it was like I was nervous. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew how to do a push-up and a dip and a pull-up and all of that. So I just did that. That's and then crazy. I was like, oh yeah, I don't need fucking weights to get stronger. I can do it with just my body weight yeah, and I'm still cool. paying for a gym membership <laughs> <laughs> like an idiot oh my God, uh, um, how but, long do you reckon you did that for uh, that was probably like a, maybe six months or a year of being in the gym strong. I, don't, I don't know if like not strong from a conventional deadlift standpoint no, I no, bet no. you got like from a body weight standpoint I was pretty good I remember doing testing it with Dylan I think I did a chin up with 40 kilos strapped to me I can't do that now yeah, that's hard <laughs> that's man. hard it was just one rep uh, yeah. but I can't do that now 40 kilo uh, pull up is yeah yeah pretty right. incredible pretty crazy um, but yeah, I definitely can't do that now. Yeah, fair. <laughs> so you went down the calisthenics route and then yeah. did you pivot then pretty quickly to And the... then it just pivoted into like general strength training. Yeah. I was probably still squat bench and deadlift, but I wasn't power lifting or yeah. calling myself a power lifter or whatever. Um, it was just get stronger, get, get, well, not get bigger at that point. It was get stronger and get leaner. So if I say another question I've been mm. meaning to ask as well is that the training protocols mm. that would be needed to get stronger. Mm. And then the training protocols that would be needed to build as much muscle in a hypertrophy block. Mm. Would you say that they're two very different training practices that would be implemented? Yeah, I wouldn't say they're super different, but they definitely are different. Like mm -hmm. if we look at the basics of hypertrophy, number one thing is mechanical tension, is tension being applied to the right muscles. Yeah. Um, and then if we go down, you need enough volume, you need the movements that you're doing to be stable enough that you can continue to add weight every single yeah. week or you can continue to progress it every week at least. Good range of motion, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Powerlifting doesn't really tick those boxes. Like squat and deadlifts are pretty unstable, not great ranges of motion. Same for a bench press. Right. Um, uh, in terms of mechanical tension, yes, you can add a bunch of weight to it. But like when we're doing a, a squat, that weight is not just on my quads as it would be in a hack squat. It's also on my back and my hips yeah, and my course. adductors and all of this other stuff that if they give out, then I'm not doing the movement. Whereas that's not a limiting factor for hypertrophy. So I think the fundamentals are still the same, but it's just gearing them differently. And I don't think they need to be done separately. I think training could probably be more viewed uh, rather than like an on and off switch for hypertrophy versus powerlifting. It's more of a dial of like put more emphasis on the hypertrophy stuff with machines that are more stable yeah. and maybe, maybe a greater volume or whatever. But, and then when you need to dial it back or dial it more towards powerlifting, then that's where you shift the volume. That makes sense. So yeah. if you were looking at your like training program, are you looking at your accessory based work on the back end of your program as more hypertrophy based work? Yeah, for sure. I think also though I'll look at it like where can I make up missed volume for my um, squat bench and deadlift work like say for my squats squats I'm pretty shit at I, I hinge over like a, a folded chair um, so they're not can you just tell everyone what you squat by the way yeah uh, two, 217 for, for two is my best I mean, it's ridiculous amount of weight uh, again gen pop strong but yeah. if I look at people in my weight class yeah okay. yeah, yeah. Um, but like because that because I lean forward so much during my squat, it's very very glute and adductor dominant yeah. and low back dominant. Yeah, I don't get a lot of quads out of it. So then I will go do pendulum squats and split squats, which are going to be much more quad dominant, and that's going to be the limiting factor. And like that is filling up the the gaps that my squat bench and deadlift are missing, and then the extra stuff like of just getting bigger lateral raises, bicep curls, all of that stuff. And how do you make sure that your accessory work doesn't take away from the main components of your program? So make sure yeah. like, you split your pendulum squat, how do you make sure that they're not taking away from your deadlift 
the day after or a couple of days after. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think just making sure you have your training spaced out correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so if I look at my, obviously I didn't write my program, my coach did, but yeah. this is how I'd also program for, for my people is if I have something like a pendulum squat, which is very heavy on the quads and is obviously going to create fatigue for a, a barbell squat, mm -hmm. maybe doing that on the same day as my primary squat is the go so that yeah. I'm not doing it, say, on my secondary squat day and coming in with really, really sore fatigued quads on my, yeah. um, on my primary squat day. So like on, on like today I went primary squats, uh, pendulum squats, and then I went on to my secondary deadlifts and RDLs and all the other accessories and whatever. Oh, nice. Um, and yeah, and, and same thing. So like deadlifts, maybe doing your primary hinge work of whether that's a, a hip thrust or an RDL or a dumbbell RDL, whatever it is doing that because it's so similar to a deadlift and so similar in the, the muscles that it's stressing on the same day as your primary day will yeah. let you recover better when by the time you get back around to that it. That makes sense. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. So you could basically back backload your back end of that workout with that same kind of hinge pattern work yeah. rather than put it onto the next day when you're already going to be, already going to be carrying yeah. fatigue from a... Yeah, exactly. And then you're just like constantly fatigued and you're probably not going to perform well. So it's like when I'm writing out somebody's program, I'll, I'll write out how their squat bench and deadlift work looks and then I'll put in their, their prime accessory or their main accessory for that movement. And then I'll fill in the rest of the accessories. So there's like yeah. a, a pattern to how I will write out people's programs. And when you are doing your programming for clients, mm. do you take their personal bias as of what exercises that they like into account? 100%. And especially from like the back end accessory work, if they just go, dude, I want some fucking arms. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. Like, we're going to load a back end of accessory work. So maybe accessory work of arms because that's what kind of what they want. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like it's, I think at the end of the day, like no matter how good of a program I write, it's going to be complete and utter ass if they don't follow it. So it has to be something enjoyable, so even good. if it's somebody that is a power lifter and has a very specific goal. Um, so like making sure uh, the, the a young kid who wants to be better at powerlifting but also just wants to get fucking massive biceps, like yeah. making sure he has that bicep training at the end yeah. of his sessions or like sooner in his sessions, whatever. So like and something like that's never going to take away from his primary purpose anyway. No, no, and and if it is starting to like you can address that when it's important and that's going to be during prep. But if we're outside of prep, say ten mm -hmm. weeks, uh, ten weeks or more away from prep uh, or from competition, sorry. Um, it's not as important. Like if his extra bicep work is inducing a little bit of fatigue on his yeah. bench press, whatever. Yeah. Um, does that matter right now in this phase of training? Yeah. Probably not. Cause I don't care about his maximal expression of strength right now. I want to build up his baseline anyway. We're still loading the foundations. Before exactly. We load. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then a competition and the prep is that's where we're like, okay, cool. Now we need to start expressing your strength. And how far out to so say, for example, I've got a competition in, let's say 12 weeks. Yep. How far out? Are we now starting to dial in with higher rep maxes and all that kind of stuff? Like, how would you be prepping to go into competition? Yeah, so I mean, depending on how like experienced you are, we mm -hmm. might be doing singles right from twelve weeks out. Mm -hmm. um, but you're not maxing out at yeah. that point anyway. Yeah. Like, we're we're saving that for the platform. If you're maxing out, if you max out in prep and you hit less than it on the platform, you stuffed up. Yeah, like, you, your program that was, was that was stupid. You shouldn't have done that. And is that because of the potential of doing a one rep max in training is going to be so fatiguing and have maybe so much of an effect on the central nervous system or whatever it may be, is that yeah. that's going to take away your training further down the line? Yeah, I, I think that's probably it. Like, I, I can't, you, I don't think you can say for certain what it actually is. But people also talk about, like, this time to peak thing of, like, um, you might have heard of it from strength yeah. culture. They talk about it a good bit. Say somebody's time to peak is, is five weeks. Um, and we have to ramp up to that that peak of like building up intensity each week. Um, but if you hit a, a max out in say week three instead of week five, you're probably going to be you've you've screwed that momentum and it's not going to carry through into week five. Now it's probably yeah. not going to be as good. So it's the same idea with prep. Like if you hit a one rep max like uh, two weeks out or three weeks out or something, it's going to be hard. It might be hard to replicate it. Some people can still do it. Is there a psychological aspect though on the athlete where they go well, I've already pulled this in training two weeks therefore, ago therefore I can do it on the platform that's how I think that's because uh, if, if I was going up to pull a number that I've never pulled before mm. I feel like that would be quite a, daunt, quite a daunting task where if I know how I've pulled 220 two weeks ago yeah I've had this discussion with my mates because a couple of them program differently to, to how I do um, and that's that's a very very valid reason of like obviously we've got attempts in powerlifting first second third and you're aiming your third attempt as like your one rep max or, or setting a new one rep max you can plan a a third attempt based off of what you've hit in training, um, which I think is a completely reasonable way to do it. And lots of people do it. Um, I prefer not to, because just the experience I've had with my clients yeah. is it isn't as successful. Got you. Um, so instead I might have somebody work up to a, a high end second attempt range. Got um, so say I'm gunning for a 275 deadlift in, in training or whatever, maybe I work up to a 260 and there's plenty in the tank. And on that day I go, cool. I've got like 10 or 15 kilos in reserve. I, I say to my coach, yeah. 
this is how much extra I think I could have done. We can use that as a good indication of like, okay, if you're taking 260 on your, your second attempt and you thought you had 10 or 15 in the tank on training, if it feels the same on the platform as your second attempt, we're good for 270, 275. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can predict things like that. It's not perfect. It never is because there's always stuff that can go wrong, particularly on in a competition. Um, but I think we can use little indicators of, like that. And would you be playing with like RPE, RIR, and percentage based? Yeah, yeah. I, I basically just stick to RPE and um, percentage based stuff. I don't mm -hmm. bother with RIR. Um, for people's accessory movements, like I'll just tell them to treat RPE as the inverse of RIR. Yeah, and course, if yeah. you if you understand it, then yeah, it, it all makes sense. Um, but yeah, I'll basically just use that. Percentage based stuff is for something I want to control and make sure the athlete doesn't go too heavy on that day because they don't need to. Um, and RPE is where I want to let them have a bit more control of their yeah. training and they go, cool, I feel good today. I can do more than, you know, what is prescribed because it will match the RPE and we're good. No, I like that. Yeah. How do you think mobility plays in your sport? Because you've obviously got three big, mm. um, three big movements that you need to push. You need to hit bench with a full range of movement. You need to hit a very, very deep squat. Yep. Do you play with any in your like, you know, in your warm ups or any A block of training? Do you play with any mobility work to uh, ensure that you've got adequate hip mobility mm. or anything like that? Yeah, not so much. If somebody's like super, super stiff um, and that's really what they're lacking, then yes. But I'll typically just address it through movement patterns like um, or adjusting some how somebody manages their center of mass uh, is probably the best example and th this is um, a really interesting thing it was the strength culture and yourself with the first person who kind of made me see this in a way i always thought if i had an inability to squat or an in inability hinge i thought that was a hip or an ankle mobility mm, issue yeah whereas i believe yourself and the strength culture boys would actually say it's actually center center, of, it's, it's a bit it's a, a skill issue of being unable to manipulate center of mass yeah 100 percent. so um i think yeah learning to get like so if somebody really struggles to get depth in a squat you'll see typical things of their pelvis is going to be anteriorly tilted or mm -hmm. so bum yep, stuck yep, out yep. typically that comes along with a chest up teaching them to get ribs down and pelvis under is going to open more range through mm -hmm. their hip or give them access to more range through the hip. Um, and that is, that's them managing their center of mass. This, the torso, the trunk is our center of mass because the bar sits on top of it. That's yep. can kind of be included in it as well. But, um, also like how you balance on your feet as well. If we can get a little bit more mid foot or forefoot pressure that encourages more, uh, pronation through the yep. foot, which allows for more dorsiflexion. When we're in pronation, we have access to, to more dors dorsiflexion right. as opposed to if we're supinated, then like if you just jam your feet out into the floor and try to drive the knees forwards, it just doesn't feel like you can get them as far forwards of as course. if you let, let those feet cave. Do you think it's black and white with that? Or do you think there's nuance where having an increase in hip and ankle mobility would aid squat performance? Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, but I think there's only so much that you can change. Like, is it is it that somebody just has tight ankles because they used to walk on their toes as a kid? Um, or is it because that's how their joints are shaped? And if it's because of just like an, a genuine structural issue of their joints are getting in the way of each other, there's nothing we can do to yeah. change that. We so can't. So much banded ankle exercises. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I used to do all the banded ex exercises mm -hmm. in the world, and it didn't do anything for me because my foot runs into my ankle or whatever you want to call it. You know, like it's. Right, yeah. it, so I can't it's like, get more. It's looking at the parameters that we have and going mm. right. What can we change? What can't we change? We're going to spend a lot of time trying to play with this small variable over here. We're yeah. not going to be able to do fuck all about it. Yeah. Let's play on actually doing the skill development of learning how to manipulate our body and get into it. Yeah, you just, you just address the things that you actually can change. Yeah. Um, and if it's something physical or structural, then we can't. Like, like I've got somebody who um, uh, has pretty major scoliosis. He's actually had his back fused because it was so, so major. So in bench press, I would love to see him arch more. But there is absolutely zero mobility work that I'm going to get him to do. He's got to be a better but coach. <laughs> Bend your spine, mate. <laughs> Bend your fucking <laughs> spine. <laughs> he's, he's not going to arch no matter how many times he rolls over a foam roller because yeah. his spine has been fused to address his scoliosis. That is a structural change yeah. that I cannot change. Yeah. Uh, sorry, a structural issue that I can't change as a coach. So yeah. there's no point in me trying. Yeah, to. there's no point in me. And that's obviously a very like extreme example, no, but of course. It, get, it gives the point. No, and it, it's a spectrum, right? It's like you've got the, the fusing of d joints and discs on this one, but you've mm. also got their joint and how their joints are shaped and how their bone structure is anyway. So yeah, yeah. it's on the same kind of spectrum, really. And you can only do, do so much to play with each one anyway. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I think it's probably a good point as well. Is like, like people talk about like there's a gold standard of what technique looks like which I think is a little bit of a wrong way of looking at it. Like we don't go a good squat looks like this. I think we go a good squat ticks X, Y, Z boxes. A good squat is deep enough to go into competition. Um, 
you can actually drive hard through your quads. It's safe. Mm-hmm. Like so long as if the movement is within competition standards, mm-hmm. it's safe and it's consistent and repeatable and it's strong then good. Like that is the gold standard rather than it looks like something, just making sure it ticks off those boxes. So I think there's definitely trends that float around in the social media space of fitness. And mm. I remember a few years ago, it was trying to coach people away from the butt wink on the bottom of a squat. Yeah, yeah. Would you still be going down those lines? Would you be like, no, that's the bottom of a squat position and it's naturally going to occur that you're Yeah, yeah. There. I, I think people were just viewing that in completely the backwards way. And, and I did back then as well because I didn't know it. 100%. I'm yeah. like, yep. And then I'd have clients who'd go into that butt wing and go like, no, you've just hit yeah. PB, but that was wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't fucking count. Yeah, that doesn't count. Take that way off. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, yeah no, so. that's, that, that's a really good example of like people had an idea of what was right, but really it's wrong. We're going through our pelvis is moving from anterior tilt to posterior tilt because it needs to be to get into the bottom of a squat. Yeah. So why not at the top of the squat? Why don't we just start in posterior tilt so yeah. that it doesn't have to move? Like if we can set in a squat and a deadlift or anything that where we require a brace or control of the pelvis, if we can just set it at the start and not change it while it's while yeah. we're moving, fantastic. You're going to be able to drive harder through your legs, your hips, whatever it is. Got it. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. And there's definitely a skill uh, perspective. I remember like properly learning to squat for the first time. It's actually sticking into that posteriorly pelvic position it's actually quite hard with oh, it's on your really, back. really fucking hard engaging to do. your core and all that interdominal pressure it's really really difficult yeah. at times yeah it's really really hard to do and that's like the skill issue of it that's like yeah. you just have to practice that skill over and over there's drills you can do to help you like help speed up that process yeah. and whatever like sensory drills and whatnot um but it's at the end of the day you just have to learn how to do it it's an interesting one because i think from the the layman's perspective of powerlifting or of any kind of strength-based sport you kind of look at it and go what, they're just big lads who are throwing some weight around. Yeah, you yeah. actually don't appreciate the skill development aspects of it. Like, yeah. there's a lot of skill that goes into a really good deadlift. Yeah. And there's a lot of skill that goes into a really, really good squat, as is in the bench. Mm. I just think sometimes you kind of, the Neanderthal part of the brain goes, well, they're just pushing weight. That's all they're yeah, doing. Yeah, just yeah, getting yeah. There's a lot of skill that actually goes into the sport. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think you're spot on. Um, I mean, like, I still think powerlifting is probably one of the most basic sports of all mm-hmm. time. And people who complain that powerlifting training is hard haven't played a real sport. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know but, what I would say, yeah. though? You know, I would say, I remember going through a bit of a power building block or whatever you'd call mm. it. And I remember I go- remember that as well. And I it's remember good. thinking every time I was going up to deadlift and it's like a new- like maybe from a volume perspective, I'd be pulling more volume or whatever. Yeah. It's fucking tiring, bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so tiring. <laughs> I'd be sat there and I'd have, I'd be sat there and I'd be absolutely cooked afterwards. It, it is so tiring. But it, look, what if you compared that to like when you played professional football or yeah, semi-professional yeah. football yeah. and you, you know, you had how many training sessions a week plus yeah. how many strength and conditioning sessions yeah. a week plus yeah. all of that time. If you compare that to the amount of time that's true, someone yeah. spends powerlifting, particularly at like a, a beginner to admit intermediate level, that's true. it's not as much. And you know what I would say as well is that you get adapted to the sport that you do. Yeah. So over time, you've been doing powerlifting now for the best part of what, let's say, four or five years now, maybe. Yeah, probably. Right in that room. Your adaptation to the workload Yeah. You can adapt it. Yes, you'll be hitting new numbers, but mm. you're used to what that training looks like. Yeah, yeah. As with me with football, I could go back into a preseason. It's going to suck. Mm. Like, you're running. It sucks. Yeah. But you'd be adapted to it because you've done it a lot of times. Yeah. And yeah. I think for me, especially going through that kind of power building base, I remember <laughs> sitting there. And also, it's very humbling because you instantly walk in. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm yeah, 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 yeah. And then you quickly walk in and then you've got guys who are warming up with my one rep max, yeah. which is like really humbling. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a really humbling but, moment. Uh, that's, uh, that's, it's like, it's so humbling, but it's such a good feeling as well. Yeah. That is one of the biggest things I loved moving down to Melbourne was like in my Byron Bay gym, I was one of the strongest people there. I moved down to Melbourne and I was instantly one of the weakest people in any gym that I walked into. That's so inspiring that go like, okay, cool. I'm at the bottom of the ladder. Like I have to get stronger, work my way up and whatnot. It's interesting. You instantly, and this is just a good life lesson for anyone, is that you instantly become the average of the people you surround yourself with. Yeah, yeah. You put yourself into a gym where you're the weakest, where you have no other option. You have to get up. You you have have to to get to that level or you leave. Yeah. And it's the same now with like the guys that you live with. Mm. Or let's say Ryan, for example, in great shape. Dylan, great yeah. shape, yourself, great shape. You become the average of the people that you hang out with. Yeah, 100%. And the problem is, is sometimes is there would definitely be people in that Byron Bay gym going, mm. oh, I'm the top of the mountain here. Yeah, yeah. And maybe their ego would never allow them to become... The you, bottom. The again. bottom of the yeah, bottom. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. a really, really good thing to just always be learning and then put yeah. yourself into a new environment where you're, you're a complete beginner. Yeah, it's yeah. really, really good, man. Because not many people like doing that. No, no. But I think it's, it's intimidating. Yeah, yeah. I think it's so important, though. And, like, it's 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 been such a good thing for me like 
as a coach as well, doing the same thing or having the same mindset of going like hanging out around coaches who either coach differently or are just simply better than you. Yes. And so you can learn from them and just admitting, cool, I don't know as much as them, yeah. but like I want to. And, um, and what would you be defining better than me as? Would that be their experience in coaching? Would that be their understanding of maybe biomechanics, anatomy, the strength aspect of things? Yeah, I think it's all of it. But like mm -hmm. I, I view it, it's like if there's, because there's, there's so many coach, uh, aspects to coaching. It's like there's the biomechanics is the programming. There's just generally yeah. coaching somebody like how do they interact with like that's something I struggle with how do you hype someone up and get them really going and fired up for a lift I'm not a very emotional person so that yeah. is something that's like struggling for that's a struggle that I have may I ask a question to yeah. that is that do you need that hype for your own training no and that's an interesting one because yeah. other people's motivational needs might be different to your own yeah. whereas you may be like I go into my own world I go a bit almost stoic and then I yeah, just go pull yeah. I just I put my AirPods in, I listen to some music and I breathe through my nose and I'm good to go. Like that's that's but it. Someone might need four shots of caffeine espresso. So yeah, yeah. And heavy metal music and some smelling salts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like some of my clients might need that. So yeah. being able to learn from coaches who are good at that yeah. to give my clients that is really important to me. Learning from like just hanging around people who are better than biz at better at business or marketing or sales, like yeah. yourself, for example. Mm is really really good for me like when I first yeah. got into when we first started at uh, Fitness First together it was like as much as I never wanted to admit <laughs> it it was so good hearing how you did your sales and oh, really? sitting next to you while I'm working my laptop and you're closing a sale and I hear what you say I'm going like okay cool I've got to fucking try that yeah. like I've got you I, rem I, what did, I remember it was like it was some cheesy line and it was it was really it wasn't that cheesy but it was just something that just got around um uh, somebody's barrier to mm. to uh, coaching where mm. it was like you told them the price and they said hey I've got to have a think about it and um, I'll go home and let you know mm. and you just said to them hey like 90% of people that go back and think about it never come back and get started why don't we just get started and you can cancel if you need to whatever I, something along yeah. those lines the next the next <laughs> the next sale I had I said like word for word the exact same thing because the same issue came up yeah. and I closed that sale just, just, so it's just call me Jordan Belfort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back to what we were talking about before, like just surrounding yourself and hanging out with people who are better than you at certain aspects. It doesn't have to be everything, whatever. Yeah, it's just so good. Well, I can remember so many mornings where I would see something on Instagram. That, and this is the thing, with, especially as a new coach, you see something on Instagram and you go, right, well, that might be, he looks like a doctor in something. Mm. And then I might then initiate that with a client or I might do a video on it or something. And you'd pull me up on it, to be fair to you. You'd be like, eh, dude, I'm not sure... That mm. really, yeah, you've seen that. You might be, I remember it was like a Vegas knee or a Vargas knee. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember like, the one well, you were talking squat, about. We're going to drive our knee out. And then you kind of pull me and go, well, actually, Darren, if you look at this, this, and this, it's a normal move part of a squat mm. pattern. Don't do that. And I think it's because it's good to be able to learn off people who you know more about that than me. Mm. And I will happily sit down with you, or whoever it may be, and go, right, tell me why I'm wrong on this and explain this. And then you would literally draw on a piece of paper the mechanics of things. Yeah, I remember and I love that. it. And I love it. And then about an hour later, I'm like, all right, I kind of get that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Um, talk to, so when you were prepping for competition, we spoke about how you'd be working to rep maxes yeah. and like volume and percentage and all that kind of stuff. From a dieting perspective, mm -hmm. going into a camp or prep or whatever it is, yeah. how does your dieting change th through that whole process? For, for me, it's pretty simple. Uh, it, it doesn't change because I'm in, I, I sit at, yeah. <laughs> so easy, right? Wow. Uh, that's that's kind of it. Uh, yeah, because I sit at like the low end of the weight class. Mm -hmm. I have, I, I currently have six kilos I could gain and still be in my weight class. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't change that much. I just continue to eat lots of food. So lots of carbs, lots of proteins, um, a decent amount of fats to keep my joints nice and healthy. Yeah. If, say, my joints were getting worse and worse and adjusting things in training didn't help, then maybe mm -hmm. increasing fats or, mm -hmm. you know, addressing some yeah. supplemental issues or whatever. But in, to, when we look at that from the aerial perspective of obviously mm. macros, carbs, proteins, fats, or understand that kind of stuff. Yeah. From a nutrient timing th perspective, yeah. that would be a very, very big thing, I imagine. When you're about to go pull 270 off the floor, yeah. there has to be some nutrient timing where you're like, right, I need to maybe. Okay, yeah, boom. yeah. And and so I'll be honest, this is like I've always had a good understanding of like carbs, protein, fats, calories, mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. um, tracking my macros and hitting my macros well. Um, but I felt like I could get more out of my nutrition and my training. So I went and hired a, di a dietitian um, yeah. working with Jack from, uh, from Tassie. Um, and he's like, fundamentally, my diet was good, but we've changed it now. So in the mornings I'm eating uh, because I start very early in the morning and we'll usually work for four to six hours and then have 30 minutes and then train. Mm -hmm. Like I will have a high fiber, high carb, um, bit of fats and some protein in the morning when I wake up. It's like wheat bix and a bunch of stuff whatever. And then uh, once I finish up my, like my block of clients, I'll have some really fast acting carbs. So that's English muffins and honey. 
got and, a, and a banana or something like got that. You, got you, got you. And then I'm into training, and then we're worrying about like more protein and whatnot uh, afterwards. And are you having like intra workout stuff like that throughout training? Um, at the moment, I'm not, which is surprising because I've kind of done that for the past like three years. But yeah. um, if I need to increase my food because my weight has stalled out, that's probably where I'll add in. I've got 50 grams of extra carbs to add in. So you're actually looking at your training nutrition based off your weight. You're not necessarily looking at it based on. Obviously, that performance is obviously a key metric for that, but you've always got weight in the back of your mind, realistically. Yeah, yeah. And I know that if I'm gaining weight, my lifts will be getting stronger. There's, there's oh, yeah. always that correlation, in particular with squats and bench press for myself. When I get heavier, they're just better. Um, they're just much, much better. Deadlifts, it doesn't really matter. I've dropped a bunch of kilos. My deadlift will continue to go up. Just And that doesn't, yeah. And how many times would you be training a week? Five days a week at the moment. And what's your recovery like on the back end of that? Um, pretty good. So through like block through the, the first, I run five week blocks through mm -hmm. the first two to three weeks. It's pretty good. My recovery mm -hmm. is pretty solid. Uh, by the time I hit week four and five, mm -hmm. I'm starting to feel like shit, particularly by the end of week five, I feel like pretty ass, but then I go into week one. And are, you doing a deal, are you doing a deload or anything like that? Nah. You, go, you just go then back. And does I go, the volume change based on the different phases of training? The, the volume doesn't, me and my coach program pretty static in terms of volume. So it doesn't change too much block to block. It just changes if it needs to. Mm -hmm. uh, even with a different phase of like going competition prep versus not competition prep. Yeah. It's not too different. Um, but in week one, we'll drop, we'll cut out a couple of sets and pull the intensity back quite a bit to let myself recover in that yeah, week one. Right, yeah. um, so it's, and then, it's like a semi-deload. It's, like a, half, it's like yeah. a half deload. It's yeah. like an intro week if you wanted to call it something. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And in that time there, you're able, or you'd maybe joints heal a bit better, you yeah. sleep a bit better, everything goes like, and Yeah, yeah. By the second week, then you kind of ramp back. And then, I'm, yeah, and then I'm feeling good again in, mm. in week two. Yeah. Does your nutrition change based on, like if you have a really heavy day, and this is actually something I've experienced today, I did mm. a really pretty big leg day yesterday, mm. um, cooked today. Yeah, yeah. And I was speaking to Alexi about this, it was like, the days where I'm completely cooked is yeah. where cravings start coming in. Yeah. I want to just eat everything. And then when you are following some kind of uh, calorie control program, whatever that yeah, may be, yeah. it's really, really hard not to just absolutely eat everything in sight. Yeah. So when you're feeling very fatigued, how do you manage nutrition? Like, um, I think that? I think it's really easy for me because it's just I've got my meal plan and I just stick to it. Yeah. I've got... Uh, I have breakfast is super easy to make. Lunch and dinner is prepped for six days of the week. Love that. I don't have any issues with it. I just go and eat that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've heard Alexi talk about, I think he's doing like high, high days yeah. and low days or he, or he was doing it yeah. where like on his heavier training days or on his training days, he's yeah. eating more food. And then on his rest days, he's eating less food because yeah. his appetite is less or his yes, okay. need for it. But you just um, keep that, those, the, all those. I, I just keep it the same the whole week. I've tried doing that before, but because it means like my plan changes each day, it's so much harder for me to manage. Yeah. And I would rather just like switch my brain off, not have to think and just eat the food. I think sometimes you can get really, really stuck in the weeds of going, mm. what's right, what's wrong, what's more optimal. Sometimes what's more optimal is what works for your schedule. Yeah, 100%. And I can definitely get myself into a thing where I'm like, well, that's the most optimal way of doing it. Yeah. The most optimal way by science net or by, you know, whatever it is, may not be the best for you based on your lifestyle, based on how what your day looks like. Yep. Yep. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that's, that's like not only with nutrition but also with training as well like i just did a post on it a couple or maybe a week ago now it's like there's probably an ideal week of training out there and we want to get as close to that as possible but if it doesn't work with your life schedule and your yeah. you're just your general your work schedule whatever yeah. it's not going to work in training either yeah. so everything has to we've got life we've got work and then we've got training on top of that it doesn't come beforehand because i can't say to my clients oh no i can't train you at 6 a.m this week because i've got a big session they're yeah. going to be like Cool, I'll find a new coach. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> um, so everything, like life and work come before the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. That makes yep. sense. Um, so what do you think is going to be going moving forward? Mm. What's the kind of goals moving forward? When's your next big competition? Yeah, so it's, it's nine weeks. Um, so maybe. Are you, are you currently in prep? I, I'm like second week of prep now, yeah. Um, so uh, nine or eight weeks out, uh, it's um, a comp on November 9th in Ballarat, I think. Um, They're quite intimidating doing that. Competition. I used to be intimidated by them. Now it's like, it's good fun. Uh, this one is a bit intimidating though, because I've set myself a pretty big goal. Yeah. Um, so I've moved to a new federation um, and the, the standards that you have to hit to qualify for nationals are much, much higher. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, <laughs> it's pretty silly what I have to try and do. Um, I think it is doable if I have a perfect day, but do you want yeah. to announce what yeah, 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 yeah. Go on, go on. Um, so the, the sort of game plan currently is squat 140, uh, sorry, squat 240, Ben. 140, I might even be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll join One in. of these high standards <laughs> yeah. he's talking about. Um, no, no, so squat 240, bench 150, and deadlift 300. 
And of all those numbers, have you ever hit any of them before? No. So that's the sort of daunting thing wow. is that I I haven't hit any of those numbers before. I haven't uh, bench is very close now, which is awesome. Squats is a little bit off. Deadlift is a little bit off. Um, but I'm I'm confident that it can I can do it if everything goes well leading into competition mm -hmm. and everything goes well on competition day. Would that be at 90 kilograms, you said? Yeah, uh, it'll be in the under 93, 93 kilo weight class, but I'll weigh like 88 or something 88. on the day. Right, okay. um, and is that pretty light for your... Would there be a lot of guys who'd be capped out at 92, 93? There'll, there'll or... be a lot of guys that are like walking around at 95, 96, and they're, like they're water cutting or gut cutting down into it. And have, um, have you ever considered doing that kind of water cut? Nah. No, because again, it's like I, I could do that and go into the 82s, but that's another variable that could potentially stuff up the competition if it doesn't go well. You know, um, you know what sometimes it was like, I sometimes cut down for jiu-jitsu competitions where yeah. I'll walk around at 95, 96 kilos and mm. I'll cut down to 92. Mm. The difference with maybe powerlifting and jiu-jitsu is maybe if you cut down to 82, mm. then you're going to be the biggest in that thing. But you probably want to see your biggest expression of strength at your strongest, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. The difference between me going up to 100 kilos and me fighting at 92 or competing at 92 I'll get my neck broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because my... now you're wrestling with some dude yeah. that's 100 kilos. Yeah, and also someone who's probably cut down from one... From 105. Five, one, one, yeah. yeah, and right. that's definitely, you know, I've noticed a lot recently is when I definitely am competing at jiu-jitsu, the strength differences between a mm. uh, low 90s guy or mid 90s where I'm, I feel very comfortable there. Yeah. And then you get to that 105, 110, and now it's like I'm wrestling a bear. Yeah. And I, ca I can't, I feel there's, like... There's not yeah. much you can do about that. I need right? to get into jiu-jitsu. I, uh, I, would, I would love it. I, I did martial arts it. as a kid and I love... So my instructor, it was, we, we did like a traditional martial arts called Hapkido, um, but my instructor it had... very Byron. It was very <laughs> it Byron. <sounds> very, <laughs> very, very Byron. Um, but my instructor had done an MMA fight and so he wow. practiced jits and all of that. That's and we cool. used to do that every now in classes That's and right. I loved it I loved I, it I said to Dylan and yourself that this, your grip on the gi with your deadlift oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't want anything to do with you I'd go to wrestle you guys and you guys would just grab on it but like an iron I wouldn't be able to get up uh, yeah get... but that'd be it but then our mobility would sh suck and you yeah. just put us in a lock immediately I'd just run around in circles until you get tired <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, just out of breath yeah, yeah. Um, you know uh, Ryan one of my friends Ryan he, yeah. he made a, he's like Dan I love the potty I think it's really cool what you're doing he's like what you should do is you should do like a 10-15 minute segment at the end of each podcast mm. where it flips and now I'm powerlifting in the gym with you mm. and we've mic'd up and he, then you're talking That's actually a really good idea and then he's like well then when I'm on the pod then we'll be hiking in the woods yeah, like, yeah. that's a nocturnal fucking wombat yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I would love it if I could get you and the boys to jiu jitsu yeah oh, well, for sure one, I would actually one love time, to do it as well yeah one time when you've like made miles out of prep or you've got mm. no big we'll just go and just wrestle around but you'd be so freakishly strong I wouldn't want any part of it no, no, I would suck though, man. You my think? technique would just be atrocious. Like I, I could, I can look. My grip strength would probably be good. I'd yeah. probably be relatively strong at just like holding you in a position. Yeah. But I don't know what to do when I'm there. Yeah. yeah. So, like the last time I have wrestled anybody was when I was like 15, man. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. it would be good fun. We'll have it would be it. so much fun. Yeah, I think I, Dylan would like it. Dylan I, would fucking. Yeah, he, I reckon Dylan would be really hard to well, move no around. Neck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just, like, yeah, he's got absolutely no neck. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that'd be good fun. Once I'm out of prep, 100. percent We'll do it. We'll do it. Once you have smashed all those big numbers, we'll go. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So. When you're looking at your strength at the moment, I, I'm just, I mean this in the least disrespectful way possible, mm. and I think you may agree. You wouldn't look at you and go, oh, he's a big, jacked, monstrous yeah. guy. But then you see the numbers that you lift, yeah. and then you go, that's absolutely monstrous. Yep. How much do you think that like the hypertrophy work aids your big lifts? It's actually, it's, it's massive. It is heaps. So, um, oh man, I can't remember what study it was, but there was some sort of study that like said, um, intermediate lifters gaining one kilo of, of actual muscle mass helped them increase their, their lifts by X amount. And it was a substantial percentage. Um, and I know for a fact that when I'm heavier and when I'm gaining muscle and my legs are bigger and my chest is bigger and all of that, I am lifting more weight. It does make a massive difference. Mm. And I think particularly at the, like, at the more intermediate level, um, it's super, super important because if you go look at the, the elite guys, they're all incredibly jacked yeah, and they're yeah, all yeah. in like really good body composition as well. Half of them could step onto a bodybuilding stage and probably win. But that's actually funny enough. You, you showed me some of the pictures and videos of some of those yeah, guys yeah. and they are yoked yeah, and yeah. shredded. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So they're yeah. almost the best of both worlds where they're ridiculously strong and yeah. they're absolutely diced and look yeah. like they've been carved out of marble. <laughs> and look, like that's obviously like genetic elite yeah. and whatever, but it, at the end of the day, like it's not fat that's moving the weight, it's muscle that's moving the weight. Of course. Um, so you just, you need more muscle. So 
in alongside that strength basis, having a good hypertrophy accessory work and whatever just to aid that muscle building is yep. definitely going to aid your big compounds on the back end. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Uh, and it would be really silly to think otherwise or try to train any differently. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's why standard periodization of like hyper hypertrophy block, strength block, uh, power block or mm. whatever yeah. order it was in, um, it's kind of out the window now for powerlifting. Like it's, you just kind of power, well, you, you, just, you just do powerlifting yeah, and right. it's all of it together and you just, uh, change the dial more towards what you need. You turn the crank for wherever it needs to be yeah. more adjusted at the time. That yeah, yeah, sense. exactly. Yeah, 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 for sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, mate, we are officially out of time. Is That's there anything... incredibly uh, fucking quick. I know, Jesus. I know, I know. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? Where can people find you? If people want to like, get coaching from you, advice from uh, you, follow, yeah. is there anything like that? You yeah, want yeah. To um, so uh, you can find me just on Instagram at the moment. Um, it is charles. Oh. No, Charles underscore, underscore RPBLK, don't ask why. Um, and that's where you can find me doing content and coaching as well. There should be a link in my bio if you right. want to book in a, a free consult. Um, I am slowly getting better at the content game. I kind of suck at it, but I'm trying, hey, trying, hey. trying to post more <laughs> and more. Um, and if you ever just want to have a chat about like uh, coaching or whatever, uh, or just need help with lifts and don't yeah. actually want to sign up, yeah, feel free to message me. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, Dude, for thanks sure. Thanks so much for coming Dude, on. Dude, thank it. you for having me, man. This was, cool. awesome. this was awesome. It was so much fun. Yeah, yeah. It was great fun. Thanks so much, brother. See you soon, man.